episode 76 of Off Script with Trish Close, intimate interviews and fun conversations with interesting people. In front of my microphone today is my very dear friend, Julie Kokonakis. Hi. Hi. How did I rope you into doing this with I me? I don't. I'm still trying to figure that out. It was a vulnerable moment, obviously. <laughs> very vulnerable. Did you have a rough week and you were like, sure, I'll do it? Sure. Why not? Um, when I say dear friend, I've known you pretty much since the time I've moved here. Mm-hmm. Yep. Like so, 2000, what, three? Yeah, I moved here in 2002, and we met soon after I moved here. So right. you would just come into town. And we uh, had a mutual friend, mm-hmm. uh, Renee Dobbs. Mm-hmm. A lot of people probably remember her. She was the uh, uh, tasting room manager? Yeah, I don't know what her title was, but she was really instrumental in really kind of starting some of the early wine culture mm-hmm. in Southern Oregon. He, that so. just gave me goosebumps when you said that. She was huge into that. And yeah. she had this incredible knack of connecting people. Yes. And here yes, we are. here we are. How many years yeah. later? 17. And I remember years later. that first, um, that little motley crew of ours that we had. Yeah, it was fantastic. We had a blast. Yes, Agnishka yes. was in was in that motley crew. Yes, and now look where she's at with right. Pascal. So right. lovely. Your friend Laura. Uh huh. I met Laura. I just I met all these wonderful women because of Renee. Yes, me too. We went to a Brit show together. We did. That's exactly what. And you brought introduced- us all together. You introduced me to horseradish cheddar. You don't I don't know remember it. that <laughs> for a number of reasons. I don't remember that, but it really um, stuck with me. <laughs> I'm so happy that I was able to do that, give you that, That's the gift so that sad. keeps on giving. <laughs> um, you are, what is your official title? You're a dietitian. And you, I, yes. Okay. Yes. What is your official title? Is that it? Yeah. No, registered dietitian. Okay. Um, and I have been practicing well, a better part of 25 years. Okay. We're going to so. talk about that. But first, okay. I like to start out all of my fun conversations with where are you from originally? I'm originally from um, Michigan mm-hmm. and, and Ohio. I grew up in Perrysburg, Ohio. Okay. Um, and my family's from Ann Arbor, and we kind of went back and forth. And my and spent all my summers in northern Michigan, in Traverse City, Michigan. Um, did you grow up? Was is Ann Arbor near a lake? No, but Traverse City is. We're okay. like right on a lake. In fact, my parents live there now. Um, and it's 23 degrees, and they just got snow today. So I'm really glad I'm here. What? <laughs> yeah. Winters are tough in northern Michigan. <laughs> so you, but you grew up in Ohio. Yeah. What was that like? It was great. I the small town that I grew up in was amazing. It was like fifteen thousand people at the time that mm-hmm. I was there. Um, and um, but it had the best of kind of everything. You know, it was a really quaint, adorable little town, and I loved it. You grew up with siblings. I did. Yeah. Quite um, a few, I think. Yes, I'm the youngest of five kids. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's a big age gap, so they're quite a bit older. So um, I kind of grew up almost as an only child but I had the benefit mm-hmm. of having them around that is a good that's a good deal you had it was awesome yeah. uh <laughs> Kokonakis is Greek yes dad's Greek dad's Greek mom mom is uh, fin- Finnish maybe okay we, we never we don't know <laughs> exactly <laughs> she's uh, northern European of some sort but is your dad was he, was he born in Greece no he was born here okay um his my grandparents came over in 1928 um, wow. from Greece and um, their marriage of course was arranged that's kind of how things were done and um, my my yaya um, Mary she um, <sighs> did not speak any English they landed in they went through Ellis Island landed in Boston mm-hmm. and then she taught herself how to speak English and wow. um, read and write um, and wow. then they moved to Ann Arbor and started the Greek church. Um, there were 12 families. It's a pretty cool story, actually. 12 families um, that had, um, you know, were immigrants and had um, kind of landed there. Some, some went to Detroit, some Ann Arbor, and some Chicago. Mm-hmm. So my family landed in Ann Arbor. And so she, it was, was the marriage arranged here or? In Greece. In Greece. Yeah. And they came over together. Yeah. And that's the last time she saw any of her family. Oh, uh, ever? Ever. Yeah. Wow. She came over. So 1928, and then she passed away in. Uh, 2002. Wow. So you knew her? Yes. She was 97. Still lived alone. Or uh, my my papu passed away years before her. Papu. Yeah. That's yeah, they were, so cute. They were really cool people. And they mar- they were married the whole time. Mm-hmm. Was it mm-hmm. a good arranged marriage? Yes, it was very good. Isn't that so interesting to think about? Like, you wonder if we did that now, if 
there would be less divorce rate or a higher <laughs> divorce rate. I don't, no, it's pretty curious because um, you know she was pretty, she was quite independent and mm -hmm. pretty spunky. Mm -hmm. So of course I say you know externally our view was it was a great marriage, but um, yeah, their household was really happy and everybody congregated there. Ugh, that's the best. Um, they were they were always on the front porch, mm -hmm. you know, having a glass of wine and I love it. Yeah, where were they? Where they live? Um, Ann Arbor. Okay, Ann Arbor. Yeah. Right by University of Michigan, right off campus. The only knowledge, education I have of Greece grandparents is from the traveling pants of the Yaya sisterhood. Yeah. Well, it's not far off. And she's that's her Yaya and her Papu. Yeah. It's so cute. Yeah. And you you guys all the grandchildren called him that. Absolutely. I yes. love it. Yeah, but my my dad does not want to be called didn't want to be called Papu. So No. No, because he thought that that was you know what is he what is he called? He, Grandpa or Bumpa is oh. what Lucas calls him. Okay, now that's adorable. Isn't that cute. That's really cute. Yeah. Um, Lucas did have. Lucas couldn't say very. Your son, when he was little, he had trouble with names. He did. That's why we call you Twish. Yeah. Still. Yeah. And but my husband Chuck is suck. suck. I know. I, <laughs> sounds odd to those that don't know us, but yes. But that that's was, what he called us. Those were Lucas's names. For I you. loved it. So, what was the age gap? I know you said there was a big one, um, but. The, your four older siblings, mm -hmm. what's the last, I guess, the last sibling, how, what's the gap? There's nine years, so. That's big. It is. No, my oldest brother was born in 55, and then my sister 58, mm -hmm. brother in 60, brother in 62, and then I was born in 71. Okay, so what is the reasoning? Did they just, they take a break, and then they were like. That's hilarious. Are my, you an oops? My siblings tell me that I absolutely was a mistake. My mom absolutely denies that. She, she said, no, you were planned. I, she said I always wanted six children, and hmm. um, uh, she lost a, a baby in between my brother and I. Yeah. Um, and so that's, that's my mom's side of the story. Okay. My siblings, of course, like to torture me with. Of course. You were an oops. You were not planned. Obviously. Right. Nine years later. That's the only <laughs> logical explanation Just, <laughs> for that. So how many how many of your siblings were in the house when you were growing up? Um, really very – just two for a, a very short amount of time. And then um, one of my brothers moved um, – gosh, 1980 is when he mm -hmm. moved to Southern California. Whoa. He was the first one to kind of move away. Wow. Um, yeah. What were you like in high school? What was I like in high school? Gosh, that's funny. I have no... Do you remember high school, Julie? I do. <laughs> Where no. did you go to high school? I went to Perrysburg High School. In Ohio. Um, yes. Okay. Yeah, the Yellow Jackets. Nice. Um, no, I, high school was really... My memories are great. Um, mm -hmm. I really enjoyed it. I had um, a really nice group of friends. Um, I did sports. Yeah, what were you into? Um, I did gymnastics from a really young age. Really? Um, yeah. When I was um, nine, I started. Wow. And then um, did that in high school, and then I uh, ran. I ran track. I was mm. a hurdler. Of course. So it was, were, you, were you good? It was good. I did good. I held yeah. a school record for a while. So it was Where'd good. you go to college? I went to Ohio State, the Ohio State University. Of course. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Duh. <laughs> right? What'd you study? What'd you want to study? Um, I actually entered into my field um, within the first semester. Um, so I got a Bachelor of Science in Human Ecology, mm. um, Nutrition, a lot mm -hmm. of science, um, uh, chemistry, biochemistry, um, but got a chance to also, um, you know, kind of explore some other options, loved philosophy and some yeah. of those other courses. So you knew you wanted to go into something in the, on the dietitian side of things? Yeah, I, I don't know really why that was that kind of appealed mm -hmm. to me but um but it did and ohio state um i was lucky enough to get some grant money and some scholarship money so by default i mm -hmm. kind of ended up there but honestly it was amazing because i had opportunity to meet some really incredible people in the field mm -hmm. um, i started doing research actually there i was a research assistant for dr gene snook who did a lot of early lipid research mm -hmm. feeding studies and things so we would have um these people that would sign up for these studies these college students and i would put different lipids in their foods and feed them <laughs> You wouldn't like hand feed. Them. No, okay. no. But I would. They had to come in like for their all their meals, and yeah. then they would take their little to go bags with them. Okay, so it was interesting. What What's a lipid? Um, fats, fatty acids. So okay. different carbon 
links, chain links, mm-hmm. with different hydrogenation, basically. Okay. And then you would put it in food, they would eat it. What mm-hmm. was the goal of this? We looked at their lipid levels, their blood lipid levels, to see if triglycerides, LDL cholesterol, HDL cholesterol changed. Hmm. So it's fascinating. It was pretty fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Did you get hooked with all this research? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Sounds like it. Yeah. It was like, this is what I meant to do. Yes. I really, um, I th- I kind of thought that that would be my career path, that I would do more research than anything else. And mm. then things changed a little yeah. bit, you know, just, um, but I also worked in the microbiology lab, um, you know, just <laughs> doing DNA extraction on cotton plants. Um, and... <laughs> <laughs> and then um, I worked for the psychology department um, in their research lab, and that was actually a really cool study because um, we looked at seasonal affective disorder. Mm. And in Columbus in the winter, it is gray and rainy and icky and awful. Mm-hmm. <laughs> at least it was. It sounds in the, awesome. In the early 90s, that's how it was. I don't know if it's changed. Um, but, um, but that was a really cool job because um, I got to really understand mm-hmm. um, you know, different areas and behavioral sciences, uh, you know, in addition to the others. Do you think seasonal affective disorder is, do you think that's a real thing? Um, Gosh, you know, those, I think people who experience it really do understand Mm -hmm. that um, it causes mood change when we don't see the sun on a regular basis. Mm. Um, And I think, you know, certainly I think there's predisposition, probably a phenotype, um, a certain person that might be more affected than others. But um, yeah, I do. Let's go back a little bit. Was food a big thing in your family? Yeah. Okay. I figured. That yeah. whole Greek thing going on. Yeah. Who was the best cook? Gosh, uh, my Yaya, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, but my mom's a really good cook, and she um, learned all of my Yaya's recipes, even mm-hmm. though my mom's not Greek. Um, she doesn't speak um, the language. My dad does. But um, my mom really embedded herself kind of in the culinary culture, mm-hmm. and uh, she taught all of us. That's awesome. Yeah. What did Yaya make that was the best? Oh, geez. What she would call her peasant dishes were mm-hmm. my favorite. Lentil mm-hmm. soup. Mm. My favorite, for sure. Um, she also made noodles. Brown butter is a staple. Okay. Um, and so she would call it the burnt butter is what she would call Adorable. it. Adorable. <laughs> and we had these noodles. I don't even know what they're called. They're, they're really, like, large noodles, okay. large diameter noodles, and they're long. And, um, you know, she would do that with almost every dish. Nice. So we always had a lot of beans, um, mm-hmm. you know, chicken, everything spiced. Uh, lamb? Lamb, for sure. That was that was more of an extravagance. Like you a know, Sunday that was dinner or something? Sunday dinner, or that was definitely Easter. Okay. So uh, I really want to talk about diet with you, but I have to back up. So what did you – you graduate college, and what do you decide to do? Well, um, to become a registered dietitian, you have to do um, a post-baccalaureate internship, and it's a match program. So basically, you apply, and then you rank your choices, and then they rank mm-hmm. the applications. Mm-hmm. And I ended up in Augusta, Georgia, at Medical College of Georgia. What? Yeah, that's where I went for You a know year. I lived in Aiken, South Carolina. I know. It's like half an hour away. I know. I went to, in fact, I went to um, Isle of Palms all the time in yeah. Charleston and stuff. Yeah, I love the South. I had no did idea like, how much I loved it. Did you like Augusta? Yeah, I did. So here's the funny thing. Aiken <laughs> is very small. Yes. Augusta was like the big city. Oh, you're kidding. I didn't realize not that. kidding? Yeah, not a big city. No. At least then it wasn't. No. I mean, the Masters is there. I think yeah. the population increases significantly when the, that happens. The Good Mall was in Augusta. Well, what's not to be said about the Good Mall? Yes, the Good Mall was in Augusta, <laughs> half an hour away. The really great malls were in Columbia, which was an oh, hour away. Yeah, that's a long way. Yeah, so we're like, we're going to go to Augusta to the mall. And on a real, like, if we were really bad, we would, like, skip school and we'd go to Augusta for the day. Right. And it what was did just, you do? Uh, we there. would walk around and be delinquent and go to the mall and get, right. like, an Orange Julius or something and then go home. <laughs> Cruise around Augusta. How long were you in Augusta? Uh, 12 months. Oh, okay. A little over 12 months. And then do you go back home? Um, and then I went to Cleveland Uh huh. and followed a boy. Go figure. That's how I ended up out here, too. <laughs> it's always the case. <laughs> It is. So you met you met a boy in Augusta? No. Oh, no, okay. I had known this boy since high school. Mm. Well, since I was 10, actually. Okay. So, <laughs> no. Yeah, so right? Cute. One of those. Um, 
No, so he was he was uh, in Cleveland, mm-hmm. and so I went to Cleveland, and I fell absolutely in love with Cleveland. I didn't mm-hmm. think that I would, mm-hmm. but um, yeah, I stayed there for ten years. Did y'all get hitched? We did. Okay, so how long were you married for? Uh, five years. Okay. Yeah. Um, and this is all in Cleveland. This was in Cleveland. What yeah. are you doing in Cleveland? What were you working? Um, so when I first got there, I started out um, doing research with um, Metro Hospital, um, and I was doing um, infant formula research. So mm. children who couldn't breastfeed um, would have to be placed on different on varying formulas, and sometimes they develop intolerances to it. So yeah. I worked with. Um, some research studies to just kind of record some of the side effects or, you know, transitions and things that they had to do. That was pretty interesting. That's fascinating to it, me. It was. It was pretty interesting. And then um, I also, that was kind of a part-time job, and then I um, had a part-time job at American Heart Association, mm-hmm. um, which turned into a full-time job. Mm-hmm. Um, and I did uh, risk reduction programs for um, African-American and Puerto Rican populations for cardiovascular disease wow. in eight counties. Wow. Yeah. That's big. It was really good. It was great experience. What did you find from the research of the infant formulas that, I mean, were there better formulas, obviously? Because I know not all mothers can breastfeed, right. which I know some don't. They choose not to breastfeed, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. I don't understand. Mm-hmm. I really don't. I've right. never had a baby myself. I just don't get it. It's free food. Right. I don't get it. But it's, not, for, it's not my argument to right. preach on. Right. But for those who can't, that's got to be incredibly frustrating. Yes, and and oftentimes the I have found that you know many people that that can't are it's not for lack of trying or yeah. right. Um, so the reality is, you know, infant formula has had many iterations, um, some good, some bad, uh, mm-hmm. truly. And um, you know, the studies that I worked on were individuals um, whose babies had some GI um, mm. diseases and some things that um, that made um you know consumption difficult sure um, so you know so it, it was you know these were folks that oh man they gave it their best yeah um and that's heartbreaking it's tough because you know babies are a lot anyways yeah. and then um you put in feeding problems on top of that and it's real stressful for the families and i'm sure these new moms have this vision of i'm going to be able to breastfeed and it's going to be this bonding time and mm-hmm. then it's like nope yeah yeah, but the cool thing about it is bonding time happens, you know, outside of feeding as well. Mm-hmm. And so, um, yeah, so if baby's belly's happy, that's the key piece. If you can <laughs> yes. just get that going, <laughs> that's Isn't that true miracle. for all of us? Yes. If our bellies are happy, I mean, I'm pretty much good yeah. after that. Me too. So then American Heart Association. Yep. Okay. Yep. How, and then, how long were you there? Um, gosh, I don't even know how long I was there. Um it was from there that I met some physicians that I started working for um, and and um, kind of went to the, my next um, portion of my career. Um, I, there were um, some cardiologists and lipidologists that I worked with. They were on our board at American Heart Association, mm-hmm. and um, they needed a dietitian for one of their other research trials called the All Hat Trial, which was a pretty famous trial um, in cardiovascular disease medicine. And um, so I went over to what was then Mount Sinai Hospital in Cleveland, which is no longer Mm -hmm. there. Um, And I was their dietitian for that particular study. And from there, um, Cleveland Clinic was starting a um, new program called Preventive Cardiology. And at that time, Cleveland Clinic was a big interventional cardiology center. They did more, um, I think, interventional procedures than any place else in the world. Um, So Preventive Cardiology was this fledgling kind of... um, you know, the stepchild a little bit, for Mm. lack of a better term, of why would we want to prevent cardiovascular disease? I know that sounds funny, but there wasn't a lot of money in that, certainly. Right. And there was variable interest. Um, But the cool thing was Dr. Fred Pashko um, and Dr. Dennis Brecker were really instrumental. And Fred Pashko happened to know this group that I was with at Mount Sinai. And he said, we would really like you to come over and help us. Mm -hmm. Um, And then there was a a dietitian who um, did some kind of programmatic work for them. She was a consultant, and, um, and I'd worked with her. So we kind of got recruited and moved over. And that truly was an amazing experience because um, we got to really be in the early parts of the field of preventive cardiology and looking at um, lipids 
and nutrition and how behavior, mm -hmm. not just nutrition, but also exercise affects cardiovascular disease outcomes. Right. And why were they looking to bring you to the table? What expertise were you bringing to this? Your knowledge of diet? Yeah. Okay. Yep. As a, as a um, dietitian, providing mm -hmm. medical nutrition therapy, individualized nutrition plans for individuals. Um, mm -hmm. And then also, you know, we did research as well. That was part of it. You, you do have to bring in research grants and perform research. And I mean, it's kind of, this is a, a no shit statement, but <laughs> diet has pretty much everything to do with our health. Yeah, it impacts pretty much everything. That whole you are what you eat, yeah, right? Sure, absolutely. I mean, absolutely. It, it just, and so I think as you know, you hear in, in the media a lot, it's frustrating because we have these guidelines of what we should be eating and then those yeah. change mm -hmm. and they change mm -hmm. again and they change again. It's fun, That's one right? of my favorite topics, actually. Really? Is the guidelines. Okay, let's talk about it. Yeah, so um, the, the USDA guidelines, mm -hmm. um, as consumers, we, we assume often that they are created with our health in mind. Okay. Without political or financial interest. Not true, is it? <laughs> no. <laughs> so, um, you know, one of the things that I do now is I do a shared medical appointment with Dr. Jill Steinzik at Asante um, Physician Partners. Um, I still do that on the side mm -hmm. with her. We've been doing those for almost 10 years before that was Medi Medford Medical Clinic. And part of the, that particular session that we do is, is I really talk to individuals about question the guidelines because they are completely tied to industry. Mm -hmm. And... Um, not necessarily appropriate. And it, in, in particular, when you look at just the intake of grain um, or starch. Yeah. When you look at the cultures on the planet today who live the longest with the least amount of preventable diseases, um, they eat about one to maybe two servings of grain a day. Okay. That's it. Our guidelines are six to 12 servings. What? Yeah. So hundreds of grams of carbohydrate from flour-based carbs is kind of how most people take them in. Yeah. Grain is what? Like rice and... Yeah, rice and flour corn. and corn and wheat, right? I mean, all those things. And so hmm. the issue is, is that um, it's not suitable for a lot of people. Yeah. And so no, modification of that is really critical, and especially in the setting of either um, metabolic disease like diabetes or mm -hmm. obesity, um, it can really be pro-inflammatory. So... Yeah, and that's a key word right there. Yeah. What cultures were you finding who, who didn't eat um, a lot of grain? Where, where were these cultures? Well, so um, I lecture a lot on the blue zones. And the blue zones um, started out as kind of this human interest story by National Geographic. Mm -hmm. And it has turned into this really large research, ongoing research trial. Mm -hmm. So the blue zones are the places on the planet who have um, longevity. Um, the, that longevity is defined by different things. So um, Okinawa, Japan, they have the highest number of women over age 70. In um, Ikaria, Greece, they have um, some of the lowest rates of dementia. That's kind of interesting. And then when you look wow. at their dietary components, that's a whole interesting component there. Yeah. Um, Ikaria is, um, also was a communist island as well. Um, so there's some Eastern Bloc influences, even though it's a Greek um, island. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of interesting as well. Um, Sardinia, Italy have the largest population of men over age 100. Um, Nicoya, Costa Rica is one of the other blue zones, and they have the lowest middle age mortality. Um, and then Seventh Day Adventists in Loma Linda, California have, um, are one of the blue zones, and they reach age 100 at 10 times the rate as anybody else in the U.S. <laughs> You know, there's a commercial about the population in Loma Linda yeah. that they live on. I think it's some, like, retirement plan commercial. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it is. <laughs> but I guess that stat is true. Right? Yeah. So, okay, let's pick one of those cultures in, okay. in Italy, Sardinia, yeah. you said? Yeah. What are they eating? Well, so the dietary studies um, that they look at um, are all the cultures actually have one thing in common. They all have beans and vegetables. All of That's the only thing that is... The common thread with the all those? The common thread, yes. Okay. So mostly plant-based beans and vegetables. Um, Sardinians have a little bit of red wine every day with a meal. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like little, four ounces, not mm -hmm. like <laughs> my Boo. wine glasses. I know. That's dumb. <laughs> that is dumb. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Um, and, you know, their fatty acids are from olives and, mm. and olive oil. Okay. Um, they do have pasta, but it's not the central part of the meal. It's vegetables and beans. That's more central than anything else. Interesting. Yeah. And then what about uh, Okinawa? What so, are they eating? Interestingly enough, Okinawa has um, a large intake of carbohydrate, but it's from sweet potato. And that's because of post-World War II. Whoa. Yeah. So, right. So politics... And, I mean, everything shapes our food cultures. We can't ever really? ignore that. Um, but they have, um, you know, unsaturated fat. They have actually have the lowest intake of fats out of all of them. Mm -hmm. It's about 15% fat. Um, when you look at the other elements that they eat, people think that they eat a lot of rice, and they don't. It's sweet potato, um, soy, and it's whole mm -hmm. soy, um, tofu and, mm -hmm. and other things like that, um, and fish and seafood. Yeah. Yeah, my first guess was like, wait, don't they eat a lot of rice? Nope. Yeah. No, they don't. When you look at the, you know, the mm -hmm. dietary research that comes mm -hmm. out of there, it's not a lot. And then in Greece, is it some of the same beans, veggies, seafood? Yeah, yeah. they only eat, they eat a couple pieces of fruit a day. Um, mm -hmm. They eat vegetables mostly. Their dietary intake of fat, though, is really high. It's almost 40%. Wow. Yeah, from, from the research that has been published in terms of the, the, yeah. um, the peer-reviewed research. And it's from olives and olive oil. Have you found, I know I've, I've read a little bit of research, but I'm not super knowledgeable on it, that there are different cultures that have completely different diets. Let's say, you know, one is maybe 90% red meat mm -hmm. and they live, they're healthy and, and is, it's because of where they are in the world. Is that accurate? Well, so I don't know if I can speak to that because I'm not exactly sure what cultures those are, but mm -hmm. my first blush, you know, kind of thought on that would be, Certainly there's genetic phenotypes, and that's something you cannot ignore, yeah. right? And especially if it's a closed culture, right? If it's mm -hmm. an island or if it's, you know, so mm -hmm. you've got some genetic components there. Um, how food is produced is everything, though. I mean, so that's true. the reality, you know? So um, Grass-fed animals. Um, any rancher in Southern California or Southern Oregon will tell you mm -hmm. um, the differences in terms of grass-fed yeah. versus grain-fed. Well, and it all goes back to, I wrote just some stuff down, you know, we were told, whatever, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, that eggs were bad for you. Right. And now they're good for you. Right. And the same with, like, like whoever came up with margarine. I know. It's the worst thing. It's a bad idea. Trans fats are not good. And But people still eat it because they think butter is bad. Right. And, I mean, butter isn't, if you eat butter, a lot of it every single day, yeah, that's bad for you. Right. It's a, and butter should be a condiment. Right. Right? I mean, that's the, that's the key piece. And when I mean a condiment, I mean, you know, a teaspoon of butter in a pan with olive oil that you're going to, you know, cook something mm -hmm. lovely in um, can be, you know, a, a lovely flavor contributor but have a minimal effect on the overall exactly. diet. Exactly. Exactly. So, yeah. Uh, I had a guy on, uh, Dr. Mike Amaranthus. He is a mushroom expert. I uh, love mushrooms. Yes. <laughs> and he actually, he worked for um, the U.S. Forest Service a long time ago, essentially looking at why their trees wouldn't grow. Oh, interesting. And then in the nursery, uh -huh. um, it had pesticides or then it, the, the soil would get too hard. They would do all these different things and the trees just wouldn't grow. And mm -hmm. they were trying to replant because this was during timber, crazy logging and all this. Right. So he called some expert at I think it was OSU or I may have butchered that but he basically said go out in the forest pick a whole bunch of mushrooms put them in a blender and spray that over your nursery beds yes and then the trees grew and my point is this tidbit came from him he said um, it takes like half a barrel of oil to grow maybe an acre of corn mm -hmm. so something just insane that Corn is one of those things that it's just it's it's way too much for this planet to grow. Right. And we depend on corn so much. Right. What are your thoughts on corn? Jeez. Oh, <laughs> we don't have enough time. Are you, and, and I don't know that people care too much, but Oh, know, I care because I'm so like like I love a corn chip and a street taco just as much as the next sure, person. Sure. But I just feel like I'm getting all of this information about corn and it's just not good. Yeah. So First of all, you know, Native American corn is very different. Mm -hmm. It's a very different crop, very different nutritionally. Um, not necessarily super tasty, per se, to yeah. what our palates would would like. Um, so that's the first component is, you know, it's completely different. It's been modified so much. Um, when you look at genetically modified crops in general, 
um, you know, there's going to be some interesting things that we'll mm -hmm. see happening in that arena in terms of um, consumer awareness um, based on GMOs. Should we not be eating corn, or should we be eating different corn? Well, that's a great question. I mean, who doesn't love a, you know, seasonal corn on the cob right. from a local producer? I right. mean, in my opinion, do that. And I, I was going to ask you, is that better? Seasonal. Okay. Right? Locally produced. Oh, gosh, that gets me into another pet peeve of mine. Why, why are there tomatoes in the grocery store in December? I know. Right? right? Well, it's... The premise is it's consumer demand. The reality is is that when consumers are educated on seasonal produce, mm -hmm. um, guess what? They demand different things. Mm -hmm. Anybody will tell you, man, my tomatoes from my plants on my porch are amazing, and I don't even want them any other time of year. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Everyone says that. And so, you know, the reality becomes who's making some of those decisions for us and, you know, mm -hmm. industry – industrial food, factory foods, you know, um, the argument is always we have to feed all of these people. Based on USDA um, research and data, the average American has 3,600 calories per person available to them every single day. That's a lot. In the blue zones, their average intake is 1,200 to 1,500 calories a day. Right, which is what we should be eating every day, right? Yes. Food's expensive. It's expensive to grow. It's expensive to, um, you know, to produce, but the reality is we overproduce and yeah. we waste a lot. A lot. A lot. I don't even want, I don't even know if you know the number. I don't know, know if I want to hear mm -hmm. it. It's heartbreaking. I don't even know that I know the number now because it's, it's pretty, yeah, it's pretty disgusting yeah. actually. And I mean, I just, I look even in the produce section in my local grocery store and I'm just thinking to myself, there's no way all of the shoppers this week are going to go through all of this produce. No. There's just no way. Where yeah. does it go? So that's a great question. I mean, there, you know, when you look at the, the main grocery stores mm -hmm. um, that are kind of big box grocery stores, yes, um, they purchase from oftentimes factory farms, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's a, you know, consortium essentially of, of some of these, you know, food producers, mm -hmm. and they all come from, you know, Kroger, which is out of Cincinnati, or... Right you know, other places. I don't know enough about the industry to say, you know, what happens locally. I do know that local stores definitely carry um, local produce mm -hmm. and regional produce, which is fantastic, and most people can taste the difference in that. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, you know, our, our big box mentality stores kind of things, um, it, it doesn't make any sense, and it's not sustainable. Right. We're trying to make it sustainable, which is weird because it's not consumer-based at all. Um, it's more, you know, financially based. Do you think, and I'm, and I'm not, I feel like I sound like I'm on my soapbox with food. I'm very passionate about food and yeah, I think I are. am a food snob, but I'm not perfect. Right. I've, I've purchased tomatoes in December before because oh. I wanted some pasta that Tragic, had tomatoes, right? right? <laughs> so I'm not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but I guess for, I just feel like not enough of us care. We don't care about where our food comes from. I agree. It's frustrating. Yeah. I think when um, when consumers are given a little bit of information and mm -hmm. opportunity, then there's some pretty amazing things that happen. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of um, patients that I work with um, now, once they have a little bit of information, they absolutely change their buying habits. And they tell me that they do. That's amazing. Yeah. It's fantastic. Do you think, you know, speaking of guidelines, going back to what the government says we should be eating yeah. every day. Um, do you feel like there's a set, I don't want to say diet, because mm -hmm. I, I think that's just a four-letter word. Is there a set lifestyle way of eating that works for everyone, or is everyone different? So nothing works for every single person, first of all. But the vast majority of humans do pretty well with um, mostly plants, a little bit of animal, right? Omnivores. Mm -hmm. When you look at historically how we have survived, Mm -hmm. as a race yeah <laughs> that's really what it's been that's that's how we have survived okay um during periods of famine right that's why we have this amazing ability to um protect body mass mm -hmm. right some yes. people better than others right mm -hmm. but truly you know we are pretty amazing <laughs> mm -hmm. adapters truly so uh, you know i think that you can't put uh, the data would say the mediterranean diet 
but the Mediterranean diet comes in so many shapes and forms right. from southern Spain to northern Africa and the Middle East. But when you look at what they all have in common, herbs are the biggest piece. Wow. Yeah, fresh herbs. It's in everything, in all those cultures. Tea. Okay. Um, beans. Mm-hmm. Um, some, most every Mediterranean culture has yogurt as a pretty basic staple. Interesting. And eggs. And these are eggs from chickens cruising around in their yard. Right. Right? <laughs> They're not factory. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, one thing I did want to touch on, because I think you'll find this interesting. You probably already know this. Uh, I had Dr. Jensen on the podcast. Oh, right on. Uh, he does keto diet. Oh, which interesting. I'm, which I'm going to talk about. You, yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah. going to ask you about keto. Yeah. Um, but we were talking about intermittent fasting because mm-hmm. he does intermittent fasting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I was like, Dr. Jensen, you don't eat breakfast? Shame on you. And he yeah. goes, you know who came up with the slogan, breakfast is the most important meal of the day? Kellogg's. Right. Like Kellogg's yeah. came up, the sugary no, cereal. Industry. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So it just, it changes the way, just that little bit of information sort of changed the way I think about breakfast. Yeah. Just breakfast. Yeah, because most of the world, well, the Europeans, mm-hmm. um, especially the Mediterraneans, will do either tea or a little cappuccino. And that's it? That's it. Man, I need, right. to, I need to step up your game, sister. I need to. No, that's what I do. <laughs> oh, I'm, co- I'm a coffee drinker. That's it. That's all I have in the mornings. Okay. Yeah, so intermittent fasting um, is extraordinarily beneficial. And when you look at the blue zones, mm-hmm. interestingly enough, um, most of them have um, fasting involved in their, you know, kind of annual regimens about 100 days of the year because of religious reasons. Oh, yeah. Right? So... He explained it, but explain it again. What is intermittent fasting? So it is um, basically GI or um, rest, truly. I mean, it is no consumption of anything caloric um, or artificial, truly, Mm -hmm. um, for certain amounts of time. Okay. With most of your eating episodes spread relatively easily, you know, evenly within a time frame of, let's say, eight hours in your 24-hour day. Right. Yeah. Do you like intermittent fasting? Do you think it works? Oh, yeah, for sure it does. For It's not for everybody, right? If someone's on, you know, doses of insulin or some right. you know, medications where they need to be very aware of their food intake mm-hmm. um, for blood sugar regulation, that's a completely different thing. But most people know who they are. Exactly. Right. And just I can only speak for myself. I've been trying it where, you know, I get up at whatever, 630, and mm-hmm. I probably don't eat anything until about 1230 or mm-hmm. 1. Yeah. I don't even notice it anymore. Right. I really don't. Right. It's, it's kind of bizarre. Like, I get grumblings. I get tummy grumblings around noon. Sure. But, yeah, it's it's bizarre how quickly you just get used to it. Yeah, you adapt. And then the key piece is you can't make up your calories. Right. Right? So you can't go, well, I'm not eating in this time, so then I'm going to eat 2,000 extra calories at the end of my day. That yeah. doesn't work ever. Damn it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Night eating is really That's what I'm doing difficult. wrong. Difficult. Right? <laughs> there it is. <laughs> so you feel like, though, the, med- the Mediterranean diet, however you define that, beans, veggies, a little bit of animal, seafood, all these sorts of, like, good fats, mm-hmm. that tends to work? It tends to work, yeah. And, I'm, and when I say work, I'm not talking about – losing weight and losing inches, just making your insides healthier. Yeah. So what it is is chronic disease prevention um, or chronic disease management. Mm -hmm. And that's really what it comes down to is, um, you know, less hypertension, less cardiovascular disease, less of certain cancers, um, less dementia. Mm Anti-inflammatory. What's getting inflamed? So everything in the cellular, okay, uh, at the cellular level. So inflammation is such a funny term, yeah, because it's hard to define. Um, but you know, and there's scientists that can absolutely explain this way better than I can. Mm-hmm. But um, you know, a, a simplistic view on inflammation is um, when you have this upregulation of you know cal- kind of cellular noise, for lack of a better term, mm-hmm. inflammatory response. Nothing works well in the body, right? Um, and when you have a setting of inflammation, then anything that we put in is not necessarily going to be used in the way that it should. Okay. Right. So let's talk about, let's talk about paleo first. Okay. Paleo diet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we tried this. Me, yeah. Me and the hubs tried the paleo diet. Right. Paleo basically means, uh, well, you explain it. What is, what is paleo? Well, the popular term of paleo means um, protein and vegetable, mm-hmm. fibrous vegetables. So like paleolithic is kind of where they got this yes. from. Yes, yes. Early Early humans. Mm-hmm. So, so eat like a caveman. Right. 
early humans had pretty small brains. <laughs> Does that sound mean? I don't mean that in a mean way. No, but the reality is your brain runs on carbohydrate and glucose, yeah. right? It can take it right out of the bloodstream. Um, so you do need enough carbohydrate to be able to feed your brain and be able to store glycogen in your muscle and your liver. Mm -hmm. um, the, the goal is for less to be left over for storage because all carbohydrate and lipids are actually converted into triglyceride and stored as fat. Okay. We have this, that's oversimplified, but that's essentially what happens. Um, so a lot of metabolic problems, though, can happen. Um, one of the things that really becomes detrimental is when humans are sedentary, hmm. um, then our muscles don't require very much. We, we use our fuel very ineffectively and inefficiently. Um, a lot of times then we have elevated insulin levels, um, insulin resistance, so it can't get into the cells, and you have um, inflammation gotcha. and storage okay. is what happens. Um, so paleo is an interesting idea. Um, and I think re different renditions of this can be beneficial. When you look at, again, those cultures who live the longest, mm -hmm. they do, some of them do modifications of this. But what's interesting is Loma Linda, California, they're vegetarian. So they don't eat meat. Okay. Right? So they don't follow paleo. Right. But yet they live long, you know. Exactly. And, and paleo is pretty meat heavy. It can be pretty meat heavy. You know, it really can be. It depends. The, the piece that is so important is how much is somebody eating? Yes. Right? I mean, we, again, we have overabundance of food, and so we tend to overeat. Mm -hmm. um, so no matter what you're doing, if you're doing too much, it's too much. So pale, so I guess the difference between paleo and keto, there's not a ton of differences. Well, there can be because there's so many different ways to do it. So the traditional ketogenic diet was mm -hmm. actually started to treat um, epilepsy in young children who had seizures. Mm -hmm. um, that were uh, resistant to pharmacologic treatment. Wow. Yeah, so their brains don't do well with sugar. Yes, no right. sugar in keto diet. Zero. No sugar. Zero yeah. sugar. Right, so you're, so you're in ketosis. You are literally training your brain to use fat as fuel. Okay. So it's a, you know, NASA's been doing studies on this for a really long time. <gasps> Um, really? Yeah. What's interesting is now there's kind of the popular clean keto and dirty keto. And dirty keto is, you know, fatty meats and cheese, excess, excess, yeah. excess. Yeah. Right? Let's go dirty. <laughs> Let's dirty, dirty keto. keto right? And then there's clean Sounds keto. Sounds terrible. It does sound terrible, doesn't it? But then there's clean keto, which is, um, you know, oil, MCT oil, mm -hmm. coconut, um, uh, and really looking at um, unsaturated fats as the primary source. Right. But then there's also, you know, the old Atkins diet, yep. um, which is heavy meat, and then they revamped it, and it was heavy fish. Mm -hmm. So there's all of these things. The reality of whether it's paleo or keto or Atkins is they modify carbohydrate. They modify starch. Okay. Like, that. that's it. <laughs> So wait, we'll break that down for me. What does yeah. that what does that mean? They modify starch. So they're not eating six to twelve servings, as you know, USDA tells us to do of you know crackers, bread, cereals, rice, grains. Right. And that's what they take out. Exactly. Right. Interesting. Yeah. And so you know, to say paleo is the way to go. Well, it. I, I think it's they. You know, they say no beans. And so then you got to ignore all that literature that we have yeah. and cultures that actually do really well with beans. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the bottom line comes becomes kind of know your GI tract. If you don't tolerate beans, great, don't eat beans, right? If you don't tolerate certain things, like, Makes sense. go ahead and eliminate that. Um, but if you're look, if someone's looking for, you know, really what's going to work, um, it's highly individualized, but too much fat, too much protein, too much starch from grain mm -hmm. is always going to be detrimental. Right. You can't swing the pendulum that far. We are pretty moderate. You know, the old um, berry sears, um, was it berry sears? The zone diet. Do you remember the zone yes, diet? Yes, I do. So honestly, that's it. When you look at all the research yeah. Of all these different things. And Zone was like pairing certain foods together and eating yeah. like little bits yeah. all through the day. Yeah. Well, what it is is it's over, more than anything else, it's kind of, um, I think it's like 40, 30, 30. Right. Right? 40% carbohydrate, 30% mm -hmm. fat, and 30% protein. Now, if you're doing, you know, 40% carbohydrate all from starch, well, that's different than 40% carbohydrate from vegetables and fruit and beans. 
Right. Right? If you're doing 30% fat, mostly from animal fats, that's going to give you a different you know, trajectory to cardiovascular disease than mm-hmm. if you're doing fish and oil Mm -hmm. and those types of things. And the same thing with proteins. It's fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. Um, I think Chuck probably told you this, my husband. He Mm -hmm. has been doing keto and incredibly successful with it. Mm -hmm. He's cut out all sugar. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would say 99% of the time, Yeah, no sugar. Um, And then he eats a diet, for the most part, it's meat and veggies. Like, Mm -hmm. that's it. So he's kind of doing more paleo. Yeah, I mean there then, is some there's some good fats in there too. Like we yeah. mix we mix good fats in there. And I yeah. think he told you he dropped a significant amount of weight. Mm-hmm. His good cholesterol went up, right? And his blood pressure went down. Yeah. And to me just, you know, it's one thing when yeah, you lose the weight. But it's another thing when your blood work comes back to show that whatever you've been doing is clearly doing something good for you. Right. And weight loss often causes that yes. change, which is nice. Yes. <laughs> it's a plus. Yes. <laughs> it, it's that uh, pat on the back for yeah, like suffering. Yeah, go <laughs> yeah, for and taking not, care of yourself. Not having ice way. cream ever again. Right? No, I know. And then I know you and I were talking, and you asked me if I'm doing keto. And I said, yeah, kind of modified, though. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm not, I'm not doing a very strict keto. Right. But I, I'm just kind of doing what I want to do. Yeah. Like, well, but you eat your instinct. Mm-hmm in terms of how you choose food is actually really balanced. I hope so. It is. As, as long as I've known you. you I've, I've really tried. No, you have really good understanding not only of the science, but also of food and food culture and food um, preservation, mm-hmm. truly. I mean, you really understand that. That's why you're so involved with everybody locally. I think people always give, especially the South, crap for eating like heavy, buttery food. And it's just, it may be true now. But yeah. when I was – when my mom was a youngster and when I was a youngster, it was not true. All the meals were home-cooked and they were vegetables from the farm. Yeah. Very little meat because they couldn't afford it. Absolutely. Uh, fresh eggs, beans that were grown from their farm. Mm-hmm. And so all of these fresh vegetables that they would pick in the summer and then freeze them and then we would eat them all through the winter. Right. And, I mean, that should be a blue zone because everyone in my family has lived to over 90. Right. It's insane. Yeah. So um, I was just speaking with one of my patients actually two days ago, and um, her father or grandfather, I can't remember, um, grew up in um, Mississippi Mm -hmm. on a farm, Mm -hmm. just turned 100, and same exact dietary culture that you just described. So that's it. Like, that's... Yeah. They would go pick turnips and Mm -hmm. use every part of the turnip and eat it for two, three days Mm -hmm. with a, you know a part of the pig that they slaughtered and it was just this little tiny bit because that's all that they could afford. They had to stretch right. it out. Right. And no no alcohol, which I think is stupid. Well, yeah, that's dumb. A little moonshine, actually. I think oh, a little moonshine. Nothing wrong with that. Maybe. How is moonshine? Isn't that, isn't that corn? I no, think so. Is, oh. I don't know. See, there's a use for corn. Yeah. <laughs> Yay, we found it. <laughs> so do you have the same thoughts on um, like wheat flour products that you do on corn? Yeah. Okay. Well, so... GMO wheat for sure, um, and I mean, is that is that considered is that what we would call gluten free right now? Um, so gluten is the is the protein in wheat. Okay. Um, modification happens with the crop. Mm hmm. Um, you know, at the seed level, literally. But um, celiac disease is a disease of the intestinal tract where the morphology of the cells they just look different. So instead of the you know, mm. tract being the enterocytes being like this, they're kind of like that. That's what they look like. Um, so what's important there is that um, not everybody's gut can digest the protein um, in wheat. Yes. That's gluten. That being said, when you look at the uptick in non-celiac gluten sensitivity, it's a category of disease, it's tremendous with the uptick in GMOs. Whoa. And you see it more in North America than you'd see it in Europe because GMOs are not allowed in Europe and haven't been. Wait, say that again. An uptick in? GMOs. GMO wheat specifically. Um, is tied to an uptick in? Non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Wow. Johns Hopkins did a really interesting study on this, and their GI, um, their GI group, they did this interesting map of, you know, kind of an overlay of, um, GI problems mm-hmm. and the introduction of these GMO crops. So yeah, I mean, you know, wow. gut health is not 
on anybody's yeah. <laughs> radar when it comes to, you know, how we're modifying our food supply. And GMO, genetically modified organisms. Yeah. And this basically just means they ain't real. They are, they are real. They are modified in a way um, that becomes likely unrecognizable by right. the body and unnatural. I mean, it's just like artificial sweeteners. You know, they're two amino acids oftentimes, mm -hmm. right? The problem is, is that we used to think that they were great. You know, when I start, first started practicing, saccharin was awesome until it wasn't, right? Yeah. And so we've got to realize that just because something hits our food supply doesn't mean that it's safe. First, first of all, it's called mm -hmm. generally recognized as safe. Like, that's the category, the grass list. Here's another question for you, and then we'll wrap up, I swear. But I feel like we could talk about food and diet all day. Will you come back? I, sure. This has been fun, right? No, it has been. No, it's been really good. I like hey. talking to you without uh, without a microphone. Oh. Oh, my ring just came. Here, I'll grab it. I'll grab it. I'll grab it. Um, Thank I you. like talking to you as well, but I really – I knew you were smart, Julie Kokonakis. <laughs> I didn't know you were this stinking smart. You're being silly. No, I'm not. You are – I mean, I, I just, you are, are brilliant. I mean, when I say I have an expert on my podcast, I have an oh. expert on my podcast. I'm not kidding. You're really stinking smart. Um, a lot of people will say, I don't eat sugar. I, I eat honey, though, because mm -hmm. it's better for me. Right. Does the body, though, recognize, Chuck says this to me all the time, sugar is sugar is sugar. So honey has different elements, certainly, than beneficial. Table, yeah, than table sugar especially local honey, mm -hmm. where you are. They mm -hmm. say that um, there's, you know, potential for decrease in seasonal allergies if you have a very small amount of yeah. um, local honey, and that would make sense from a pollination standpoint. But um, how do we utilize carbohydrate? Well, sucrose, whether it's a, a disaccharide, a monosaccharide, a polysaccharide, we are going to break them down mm -hmm. into glucose. Mm -hmm. um, Beans are a little different because those are broken down actually into short chain fatty acid in the colon because um, the molecules can't be cleaved. They're so bound in fiber, it's called resistant starch. Hmm. So that's the only carb that's inherently different than the other carbohydrates. Interesting. But simple sugars, which are quickly digested, they get into their glucose molecules immediately in the bloodstream. Um, and yeah, you're, it's going to raise blood sugars. Okay. So, I mean, and would you say from a dietitian standpoint, if you're going to use a sweetener, would is it better to use honey than um So that's always an interesting question because it depends on the person. Okay. Right? So, no sweetener is always better. Right. No line. sugar. Really? Right. right. Vegetable, fruit, right. Right? Right. Um bound in fiber. Stuff is bound in fiber. Honey is not bound in fiber. No. But a small amount you know, for an individual who is able to control blood sugar levels well, mm -hmm. you know, their insulin is working real well and they're exercising and all that stuff, it works out probably just fine. It kind of goes back to that whole everything in moderation, including moderation. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. Little, little bits instead of, you know. Large amounts. Don't eat the entire jar of honey in a week. Right. <laughs> it's easy to do. But eat the honey. I mean, go go get the local honey because bees are important. Yeah, no, they are. And I just actually planted, I'm starting to plant some pollinating plants in my yard mm -hmm. to bring back butterflies because I've been here 17 years and I've noticed a significant change in the amount of butterflies that we we yeah. just don't we just don't see them anymore. So I went over to Shooting Star Nursery. Yeah, is it milkweed? Um, is that what? It's milkweed. There's a whole bunch of them. They okay. have these cool little like vignettes. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> that you can go and, like, purchase different plants, and they show you how to do all that stuff. It's super cool. That's amazing. So I, you know, I could have spent way too much this year, but I, <laughs> I just got some small starters. Well, you're going to have butterflies in your yard, I'm hopefully. So, you'll have to come over. Um, yeah. We talked about Lucas a little bit. Let's talk about Lucas for a hot second. Okay. He's how old now? 17. He's 17. And he is – how did he get into snowboarding and skateboarding? Um, skateboarding actually was our after school activity in kindergarten. Okay. Um, and I don't even know how it started. We used to go to Bear Creek Park every single day and mm -hmm. walk and mm -hmm. he would jump around, right. you know, <laughs> he never stood, there was no walking. No. Um, and the skate park is there. And so he really wanted to start doing that, but he wanted to run up and down the ramps. And oh. that, you know, no skateboarders want a little kid cruising around, running no. up and down. So I said, let's get a board. And so that's how we started. So he started taking his mm -hmm. skateboard. And then from there, you know, his dad's big into winter sports. Yes. 
And his dad was a skier, really accomplished skier, actually, um, and um, Nordic skier, and then downhill. And then um, I started Lucas out at, um, you know, skiing on the bunny hill mm -hmm. at, uh, at Mount A, mm -hmm. which is, was fun. And then I, he said he wanted to do snowboarding, and I was like, I'm out. Like, I don't snowboard. Right. <laughs> and so his dad actually converted what? to snowboarding when Luke was – so, gosh, his dad was probably – 40 I don't know how old he was but Lucas was five or six and his dad bought him a snowboard and bought him the setup the gear so uh your ex-husband Jared yeah. wasn't he like junior olympics or something I think he was I don't really remember but he was nordic he was hardcore nordic skier really, really good really good really good like stupid good yeah yeah nordic skiers are unique anyways like yeah. the vo2 max through the roof and well Jared's kind of unique so yeah, he is. we he won't is. get into that <laughs> he is um but he he switched over to snowboarding at 40 yeah just so he I, could snowboard with Lucas yes that's pretty cute. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, and it and did great. And now Lucas is amazing. He's really good. He's really, really good. I know. And he doesn't want to compete, which is interesting. Which um, I, he, it's really sweet. No, he just doesn't want to. But he's the kid that, you know, launches a Misty 720. I don't even know what it is. <laughs> I have no idea. Yeah. But um, he does flips and turns and things like that. He's pretty Just awesome. Just off the slopes. I mean, he he doesn't – I don't think he does stuff a lot in the half pipes or anything like that. But okay. he does the train parks, you know, with his mm -hmm. friends. And, um, yeah. And uh, When does he snowboard, does he wear a helmet? Yeah. Oh, yes. You, okay. Good. Absolutely. Okay. No, he he Ooh. won't not wear a helmet. Your your mom just came out right now. <laughs> you totally did this. <laughs> absolutely. Right. Like total mom came out. I don't think I've seen that on you in a long time. <laughs> oh, it's there. <laughs> he and I he and I just had a mom moment a couple days ago too. So they need them. Yes, they do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's a good kid. He is a good kid. He really is. He's a sweetheart. Yeah. Okay, let's wrap up. I prepped you on my final three questions. Yes, you did. Best advice you've ever been given. Oh, so this is a nice question because truly the best advice I have ever been given was kind of later in life. And um, it was um, to quiet your mind, kind of eliminate the chatter, mm. and surround yourself with people who can do that too. Ooh, Right? That's good. It's so good. I use that every day. Um, does that mean in form of like meditation? Um, meditation, yes. I've been um, meditating for a little while now. I'm not, I don't feel like I'm good at it, but I have noticed that I can um, get to a lovely kind of quiet mind really quickly mm. now. And it used to take me <laughs> for flipping effort. Yeah. I'd be like, okay, well, <laughs> this isn't working. <laughs> I've been at this how long? <laughs> Five minutes. Oh, it's been, six minutes. Yeah, six seconds more like it. You yeah. know, so um, so that's been really nice. And I use um, I use some online like um, apps. Yeah. For music, and I used to do the guided meditation stuff. Now I just do the music. It's pretty great, and it helps. It helps a lot. Okay. Yeah. What's the biggest benefit of quieting your mind? Oh, uh, for me, concentration. Okay. Um, uh, peacefulness. Mm -hmm. Um, stress reduction. Oh man, we've got. I feel like that there's moments where I'm just kind of looking off into the distance because I have 20 million things happening in my brain. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, the, the, the effort to quiet that would be nice. Yeah. Well, you handle a lot of stuff, mm -hmm. truly. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so being able to um, allow yourself to be in the moment without judgment, yeah, quiet. And I would think, I, I will say this, meditation takes work. You, it's, it not, it's not a couple days thing and you have it. It takes a lot of concentration mm -hmm. to meditate. Yeah. But those apps really help, especially the guided meditation ones, okay. because um, all I did was just listen to them. I had no expectation, mm -hmm. right, which is part of meditation. You should never totally. have an expectation. Like, I feel oh, great. I'm, I'm bad at this, right? <laughs> like, we shouldn't be judging ourselves. That's terrible. Kind of goes against the whole purpose. But um, but I would just listen to them kind of in the background, maybe in the morning when I was getting ready for work. Mm. That's what I started doing. And I like the guided meditations that I like were like a British male voice. <laughs> I called him my, my boyfriend. Was the, you know. That's awesome. But um, then I got to a point where I didn't, the guided portion was, I didn't like it anymore. And oh. I just wanted the music. And so. It's good um, advice. It was pretty great. That's really good advice. Uh, if you ever left this place, Southern Oregon, what mm -hmm. would bring you back here? What would you miss the most? Um. I think the climates 
the best thing mm -hmm. because it's season change, but really mild. Mm -hmm. And that was my, after living on the Great Lakes for 31 years, um, I forget until I get a picture of snow. Yeah, it's not 23 degrees <laughs> no, today. It's not 23 degrees. Or snowing. <laughs> yeah. Going into seven months of deep freeze. Yeah. Literally. Oh. It's brutal. That sounds brutal. Yeah. It's beautiful in the summer. Like, mm -hmm. there's no place like the Great Lakes in the summer. Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh. But the winter, I, I think the winter's hard. But there's really, there's great sports. Is too. there humidity there in the summer? A lot, yeah. Okay. Not as much the south. Okay. Like, not... It's, it's, okay, a fair, a moderate amount compared to what you. You're it's used like to. you choke when you go outside. You do. It's just like. I yeah. love it though. I do too. I, I do love too. the South. Yeah, yeah. And the hum I, my skin loves the humidity. I yeah. yeah we, my sister and I call it the plumping effect uh -huh. because like all my wrinkles go yeah. away, and you're just like, Ooh. oh wow, look how young I look. <laughs> uh, final meal, final drink, <sighs> dietitian. That's impossible. Well. It's impossible. Make it happen. Like, that's hilarious that you would ask that. What would yours be? Can I ask you that? Yeah. I know exactly what it would be. I would oh. probably I would probably do courses for sure. Okay. I'd have a... Yes. Okay. Okay. I'd have a good cheese board, mm -hmm. charcuterie, mm -hmm. some fantastic bread. Yeah. Maybe some, like, super fresh, like, poached shrimp, mm. something like that. Yeah. And then main meal would be the best... The best filet mignon that I could find, mm -hmm. you know, prepared the most perfect way, palm frites mm -hmm. of with a truffle yeah. aioli. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's very specific. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I would probably start with bubbles because yes. it's bubbles. Yes. And then I would just have a really fantastic bottle of wine that made me happy. That okay. would be my final meal. I love that. Thank you. No one's ever asked me that on this podcast. No way. Thank you. Absolutely. I've been dying Seriously, to share. Wait, what? I know. You've done how many of these? 70? You're 76. No one has asked me what my final meal would be. Huh. So thank you. No, I'm so, I'm really <sighs> curious. And yeah, because that is really specific. And also, I like that you could do courses. Yes. Because that's exactly what I was thinking. Like, I would do courses. I should explain that. Maybe when I prep you guys, you, it's whatever you it's want. It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So shoot. Go for it. Well, I have a few. Go for it. Okay. So either some form of tacos with tequila. Yes. <laughs> I mean, that. that's always good. Always. Um, preferably on a beach. Okay. Um, but, you know, really co courses, it would be, you know, um, my Yaya's lentil soup. Mm. Um, it would be some sort of a seafood risotto mm. or a seafood orzo with feta, and, right? Um, my favorite drink is scotch, but... Right. Um, but I don't find that I do a lot of scotch with my meals, right? So a that's really after dinner. Yeah, right. A really nice glass of wine. Mm -hmm. You know, that would that's really it. And then a good scotch. And then a good scotch. What's your favorite scotch these days? Um, I still like Oban. Okay. I just tried a newer version, you know, cheaper version. My budget, you know, <laughs> gets in the way <laughs> of my scotch <laughs> drinking. Um, and it was pretty good, but it's I still like the traditional Oban. Some of my favorite. Go big or go home. Right. Mm -hmm. That's what I say, too. That's what I think. You have been a delight. Oh, that is so sweet of you. I was really nervous. Oh, gosh, you, you shouldn't know. be. You're so stinking smart, Julie. And, and I mean, Fish. I love you. I love you anyways, but just listening to you spout off all of your knowledge. I probably got a lot wrong, I'm sure. Oh, <laughs> my love for you is even more now. So I just love you. I love you too. Uh, if you're listening to this podcast on iTunes and you like it, please subscribe, rate, and review. It helps other people find us. You can also check out the video portion at ktvl.com. Just click on features and then off script. And one more time, my good buddy, Julie Kokonakis. Thank you. Thanks, Christian.